Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. To start off tonight's program, I will be reciting one page from Surah Ibrahim, uh, from ayahs 24 to 42. Sallu Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Wa atakum min kulli ma sa'altumuh Wa in ta'uddu ni'mat Allahi la tukhfuha Inna al-insana la-zalumun kaffar Wa idh qala Ibrahimu rabbi ja'al hadha al-balada amina رَبِّ اجْعَلْ هَذَا الْبَلَدَ آمِنًا وَاجْنُبْنِي وَبَنِيَّ أَن نَّعْبُدَ الْأَصْنَامَ رَبِّ إِنَّهُنَّ أَضْلَلْنَ كَثِيرًا مِّنَ النَّاسِ فَمَن تَبِعَنِي فَإِنَّهُ مِنِّي وَمَن عَصَانِي فَإِنَّكَ غَفُورٌ رَّحِيمٌ ربنا إني أسكنت من ذريتي بواد غير ذي زرع بواد غير ذي زرع عند بيتك المحرم ربنا ليقيم الصلاة فاجعل أفئدة من الناس تهوي إليهم وارزقهم من الثمرات وارزقهم من الثمرات لعلهم يشكرون ربنا إنك تعلم ما نخفي وما نعلن وما يخفى على الله من شيء في الأرض ولا في السماء الحمد لله الذي وهب لي على الكبر إسماعيل وإسحاق إن ربي لسميع الدعاء رب اجعلني مقيم الصلاة ومن ذريتي ربنا وتقبل دعاء ربنا اغفر لي ولوالدي وللمؤمنين يوم يقوم الحساب ولا تحسبن الله غافلا عما يعمل الظالمون إنما يؤخرهم ليوم تشخص فيه الأبصار صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوات السلام عليكم Hi, assalamu alaikum to everyone here and at home. Um, camp is in two weeks. If you haven't registered yet, you're past the late deadline. Um, and if you're male and you register now, you'll be placed on a wait list. But you can probably still come. So inshallah, please register if you haven't. Um, and we look forward to seeing you there. Uh, this Sunday, the brothers will be getting together and cleaning up the closet upstairs. If you'd like to join us, we'll be having lunch afterwards, inshallah. I think that's most of my... Hmm? Oh, yeah, if you registered for camp, um, read, expect some health forms and like consent forms uh, to come in the next few days through email, inshallah. I think, they, I think all the kids have uh, vacated already. So I don't have to ask them to leave. Yeah, um, the donation box will be coming through in a few minutes, inshallah. If you could make a donation, that would be greatly appreciated. We operate directly off of donations. So this, all of this is because of you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, but yeah, without further ado, uh, please welcome our wonderful speaker, Dr. Sayyid Mustafa Al-Qazwini, with your loudest salawat. Please, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. 
Thank you, uh, Fahad Al Khatib. Inshallah, uh, we see you uh, becoming a husband soon. Inshallah. Inshallah. He's working on it, by the way. He's working. His father told me this yesterday. Yeah. So, alhamdulillah, this is happy news. And it will happen, inshallah ta'ala. For most of you, it will happen. But you have to work on that. You have to work. Nothing comes free. You have to work so you can earn it, inshallah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. والصلاة والسلام على أنبياء الله جميعا وعلى سيدهم وخاتمهم حبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين وأصحابه المنتجبين ومن تبعهم بإحسان وإيمان إلى يوم الدين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي Tonight's topic is very sensitive and it's very challenging. The title that they have chosen for me or I have chosen for myself is how to fulfill, how to live a fulfilling life. And this is, you have to have experience in life to speak about this subject. You don't read these things in a book. You have to speak them from the heart, from your life experience. You have to meet people who are really leading a fulfilling life, who are satisfied, people who are satisfied with their life. So it's not easy, so forgive me for my shortcomings. And at the end, I would welcome your comments not just your questions, but your comments and your feedbacks, because this is meant to be a discussion among us. It's not a lecture. It's a discussion among us. And I want all of you to feel free to participate, to speak, to deliver. And I'm going to ask each and every one of you, inshallah, once I stop speaking soon, to uh, introduce yourself because one of the main reasons we are here on these sessions is to get to know each other we need to get we socialize here we network here this is the main reason we are here to network i don't know many of your names maybe many of you you do not know maybe you know my name but i don't know whether you know uh, things about me or not. I hope you, you know good things about me, not bad. So we have to be prepared. Mention your name, your school, or your job, or your town, if you want to, if you are married or single, or, or, or <clears throat> on the path to, to, to inshallah, getting you know, married soon. You may mention that. And we're going to celebrate the birthday of some of you tonight, inshallah, here, you're going to, to hear their names and also celebrate the weddings of some of you, recent weddings that took place in this community, alhamdulillah, among the young ones. And we, at the beginning, I welcome those who, who are here for the first time, maybe some of you are here for the first time. I welcome you and inshallah, you try to make it every first Friday of every month. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. So how to live a fulfilling life? Fulfilling life does not mean you are always happy. You are always smiling. No. It means you can have inner satisfaction. You are happy with what you are doing. You are happy with where you are. And you are content. And one of the best gifts that God may bestow on his servants, his true servants, is the gift of contentment, the gift of qana'ah, the gift of inner satisfaction, the gift that they have peace of mind, 
they know that they are doing the right things. They are journeying on the right path. They don't regret every day, every night, every week, every month of their life. They don't regret what they are doing. But they are happy with what they are doing. So this is a life of fulfillment. How do we reach that point? I'm going to share with you a few points that I did not read them in a book. In fact, I was driving in Switzerland a few days ago between some Swiss villages, breathtaking views, and I was speaking to them, and my son was sitting next to me, and he was typing. I told him, grab your phone. I want you to put these points, you know, and then send it to me. So it comes from my heart. Number one requirement to have a fulfilling life is to try to be independent. It won't be easy. You might fail several times. You might suffer several times. But, but at the end, you will succeed. God promises us that if we aspire to do something and we are sincere about it, then he will help us. He will guide us to fulfill our dreams, to reach that point. God says, I put you here on earth, but I want you to work. I am there. I'm watching you. I'm observing. I'm seeing. I'm hearing. I'm listening. But I need you to take the initiative. God is not going to take the initiative on your behalf. God says you, you have reason, you have a brain, you have a free choice. And therefore, I want you to act upon these gifts. So you go forward, I'm going to push you. I'm going to help you. I'm going to support you. I'm going to back you. Those people who reached the pinnacle of their success, it was them. Yes, it was God's help, but it was their own choice and their own initiative. So try to be independent. Try to break free from being dependent on your parents. While we were traveling in Germany, Sayyid Muhammad, he shared with me this piece of news, which happened in Germany, not far from where we were. We were in Stuttgart, Germany, and this story that I'm going to share with you happened a few kilometers from us. It was in the news. It was international. Maybe some of you heard this. Uh, a small German town elected a new mayor. And this mayor is not German. This mayor is a refugee. A refugee who had arrived in Germany only seven years ago at the age of 21. Now he's 28. They elected him a couple of weeks ago as the mayor of this German town. This is a success story. This is an amazing story. A man who was a refugee. And he fled Syria. He lived in Lebanon for a few months. Then he went to Turkey. Then he went to other countries. And until he reached his final destination, which is Germany. And they elected him because they have a trust in him. They don't know his family. They don't know anything about him. But what they know is that he's a serious person. He's independent. <clears throat> he can make a change in their life. And he says in one of the interviews, he says, I was 21 when I left Syria. And I was completely dependent on my parents, financially, socially dependent on my parents. He said, my goal and my dream was to have fun with my friends, hang out with them in the evenings, go to this cafe and that restaurant. I did not have sense of responsibility. But then when I left Syria at the age of 21, and I journeyed through difficult terrains, harsh terrains, until I reached and I saw myself struggling to keep myself safe, not to drown, not to be killed, not to be captured. I have a survival. I saw death with my eyes. This is what he says. 
So this experience changed my life. I came to Germany and I decided, number one, to be independent. I have no parents with me. My parents are back home. I know no one here in Germany. I was at a refugee camp that I decided that I have to begin a new life, a new chapter in my life. And this is how I started. And you can do the same. All of you can do the same. Even if you are younger than 21, even if you are 17, 18. It's not easy, but it is doable. You will fail in the first attempt, in the second, in the third, in the fifth, in the tenth. At the end, you're going to succeed. And you're going to be proud of yourself. And your parents are go going to be proud of yourself. Put your trust in God and begin this journey of independence. You will earn respect and you deserve the admiration of people and you will gain dignity. Dignity, when you are able to stand on your feet, you don't need your father's money, you don't need your mother's help, you don't need any family member's help, you make yourself. But remember, you have to sacrifice, it does not come free. Some nights, you're going to go hungry, you're going to feel lonely, you're going to suffer, you're going to be abandoned by some people. But God would not abandon you. So you must begin the journey of independence, especially when we live in this country. When you live in this country, even if your parents are rich, say, I have to create myself. I have to build myself. I have to depend on myself. And many of you have to work. In order to be independent, you must work. Even if even at an early age, the age of 18. At what age you can work in this country, in this state? 16. Even at the age of 16, begin a part-time job. The summer is coming and you can afford it. Even if they give you minimum wage, even if they give you, at, at some point in my life, in the beginning of my marriage, I was working for free, just to be recognized. I was working at a TV station. I was writing articles. In the beginning, I worked for a few months for free. After that, the director came to me and he said, we want to hire you and we're going to pay you. We can do this. Stand on your feet. Be independent. So this is number one. Number two, learn to respect all people around you. Never look at people, people's identity. Don't look at their religious identity, their political identity, their sexual identity, their social identity. Look at them, look at one thing in people only. Only consider one thing. Their humanity, they are human, they are insan. They are a human being. And God says in this book, in chapter 17, وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمْ Indeed, we have honored the humans. He didn't say we have honored the Muslims or the Arabs or the white or the rich or the American or the European. He said, وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمْ The children of Adam. Any human being deserves respect, deserves attention, and deserves help. So respect all people around you. And don't take any person for granted. Don't take your mother for granted. Don't take your friend for granted. Don't take your teacher for granted. Don't take any person for granted. And try not to hurt any person in your life. This is how you create satisfaction and inner happiness. When you don't hurt anyone in your life. When you go home in the evening, at, at the end of the long day, a long day, when you put your head on the pillow, and then you feel that today I did not hurt any person. I didn't say any bad word. I wasn't harsh with any person. I wasn't mean with any person. That is the happiest day. 
The happiest day is not when we make money. The happiest day is when it passes by without us hurting anyone. That is the happiest day. Money might earn you some smile and joy, but not inner satisfaction. Some people make money, but they are still unhappy. I met a lady in Germany who said she was working as a model and she was making a lot of money. But then she decided that I wasn't happy. I'm a model. I'm making a lot of money. People know me. My pictures are everywhere. But I'm not happy. So she changed. She's serving Islam now. She says they give me a little bit of money, not even 5% of what I used to make, but I'm happy. I'm very happy. I'm the happiest person because I'm serving God. In the past, I was serving myself and the dunya. Now I feel I'm serving God. Though she's not making a lot of money, but she's happy. So when you don't hurt people, when you don't harass, when you don't annoy, when you don't disrespect, this is the beginning of your happiness. This is the beginning of your inner satisfaction. And begin, my friends, with your parents first. Number one. Number one people in our life, even after we get married. Number one people in your life are your parents, your mother and your father. Try not to hurt your parents. Sometimes... Some parents are not good to us. They are not always kind. They are not always behaving Islamically and morally. Some of them hurt their kids. Some of them abuse their kids. But don't do the same. Don't do the same. God says in his book, even if they overburden you, even if they ask you to disbelieve in God and reject God, still be kind to them. وَإِن جَاهَدَاكَ عَلَىٰ أَن تُشْرِكَ بِمَا لَيْسَ لَكَ بِهِ عِلْمٍ فَلَا تُطِعْهُمَا Do not obey them when they say disbelieve in God. Don't obey them. Do not obey them. But be kind to them. وَإِن جَاهَدَاكَ عَلَىٰ أَن تُشْرِكَ بِمَا لَيْسَ لَكَ بِهِ عِلْمٍ فَلَا تُطِعْهُمَا وَصَاحِبْهُمَا فِي الدُّنْيَا مَعْرُوفًا مَعْرُوفًا With kindness. Live with them with kindness, with respect. Because they are your biological parents. Biological parents make a huge difference, my friends. Today I mentioned this in my Friday sermon. A person comes to the imam and tells him, many members of my family are non-Muslims. They are non-believers. Do they still have right upon me? Imam says, indeed, they have right, even if they are non-believers. They are still, because they are your biological relatives, blood relatives. Your parents have rights upon you. Even if they hurt you, do not retaliate against your parents. I know many of my friends, the reason for their success because they remained loyal and dutiful to their parents. Loyal and dutiful to their parents. At the time of the crisis, they stood with their parents. They did not abandon their parents. This is why today they are successful. Allah rewards you. Allah does not overlook what you do for your parents. He doesn't. He doesn't. He counts that in your D1. In your file, be kind to your parents. I know maybe some of you right now are thinking that, but my mother, she hurt me the other day. My father said bad things to me. He abandoned me. He left me. They do these things, but you don't do the same. You don't do the same. We do not return evil with evil. This book teaches us that we return evil with goodness with act of goodness. So this is the second. Third, 
exert pressure on yourself. Discipline yourself to detach yourself from excessive materialism. We need money. We need clothing. We need food. We need housing. We need nice car. We need nice bed. We need nice lifestyle. But there is a difference, my friends, between someone who uses all these things and he does not allow them to use him. God created money, so we use the money, not that the money uses us. We control money, not that the money controls us. Money, to us, like a ship in the sea. What do we need for this ship to navigate, to run, to move in the, in the ocean, in the sea? What is necessary for this ship? Huh? What is necessary? Water. Water is necessary. In the The ship does not run on freeway 405. It doesn't operate on the freeways. It operates in the sea. So we need a water. Yes, it's very necessary. If there is no water, it will get grounded. Have you seen some grounded ships because there is no water? This water is very necessary. As long as the water is from outside. But once this water starts going inside the ship, what will happen to that ship? It will sink. The same water which was necessary for it to operate and to survive and to move, when it goes inside, it brings the ship down. Same thing with money. We need the money. I need the money, everyone else, the prophets, the imams, the saints, the good people, the bad people, they need the money. But once this money starts to infiltrate my soul and goes inside me, inside my heart and my soul, it will sink me down. It will take me down. I have to keep it outside. I use it, but I don't allow it to use me. Try from this young age, and you are much able than us. You guys in your 20s and 30s, you are much more able to control this because it's all, always through training. Through training, try to resist materialism. And make always your goals in this life, make them moral and spiritual. Once you make your goals, your higher goals, moral, ethical, and spiritual, you're going to get, you're going to achieve the material goals too. But if you make your goals only material, not only you are going to lose the spiritual and moral goals, you are going to lose the money too. You are not going to enjoy it. A story that breaks my heart. I'm not saying this story to attack that person, but it breaks my heart. It's a lesson. We learn a lesson from this story. There is a brand, some of the purses and the shoes. The brand is called after a famous... Hmm? Kate Spade, Ahsan. How many of you knows her? I should say how many of you do not know her? You all know her. I did not know her until I read the story in the New York Times when she committed suicide. Before that, I didn't pay attention. After I read her name, when I travel to Paris, to Germany, to some other countries, I started to read to notice the name, Kate Spade. She was only 45. She lived in New York, in a beautiful mansion. And you know the wealth that she left behind? How much was the wealth? Three billion. Huh? Three billion dollars, right? $2.4 billion. $2.4 billion she left behind. But she committed suicide. I don't know the reason. I didn't talk to her. 
But this means that she had a lot of money, a lot of fame. Even today, even today, when you go, you see these shops. Her name is there, still there. But she's no longer there. Money could not help her. But when you put your goals, the higher goals in your life, the moral ones, the spiritual ones, not only are you going to achieve them, you're going to achieve these little material things. God says, I will send you, don't worry. Can you give me an example of how do we make our higher goals moral and spiritual and human goals? Give me an example. Beautiful, beautiful. Amir, beautiful. An example of that is a doctor, a physician, a lawyer. Someone goes to medical school, goes to engineering school, goes to law school. Some people, the reason why he or she chose medical school is to make money. I know, I know them. Some of my friends, I know them. When you ask him, why do you go to? He says, money. I want to be happy in my life. So he didn't choose medical school to save lives. Because this is a path to wealth, to obtain money and wealth. Same thing with some lawyers. Same thing with some engineers. Same thing with some speakers and scholars. He didn't study to guide. He studied to make money. Professors, he wants to make money. Same thing with any profession. But God says no. Do it the other way around. Make your goal spiritual and moral. If you are a physician, if you are going to a medical school, say, I am there to save lives. So one day, if a patient comes to me and he's broke, he doesn't have money, he cannot afford, I will treat him for free. I'll be a lawyer if someone has a case and he doesn't have money to pay, I will work pro bono. I'm not going to charge him. I'm a speaker, I'm a professor, I'm a scholar. If I get invited to a community and they say, say it, we cannot afford to pay you. I say, no problem, no problem. You know, I've said this to my kids. Sometimes I share my private stories with my kids. And because you are my kids too, you are my sons and daughters, I will share that with you. So many times I was invited to places, I had to pay my own tickets let alone they give me a gift. They didn't give me a gift. Even my airline ticket I had to pay. I went there free. After a few months, God substituted that. A check comes to me with $10,000 from nowhere, from a person that I don't even know. I don't even expect him to help me with a single penny. A person says, say, this is a gift for you. And I know that God is sending this money because of that act. When you dedicate yourself and you don't ask, God will send you. God would not leave any bill unpaid. If he does not pay you today, he will pay you next year, two years from now, five years from now. I went to Chicago in, in, in uh, when was the month of suffer? Uh, uh, I think September. I think it was in September. I was giving a speech. After I finished my speech, a young man came to me. I don't know him. I don't even recognize him. He said, Sayyid, I am Dr. Fulan. He mentioned his name. You came to Chicago 21 years ago. And I asked you to give a speech in my house and you gave a speech, I didn't have money to give you. I was a medical student. Now, I have this gift for you, $1,000. I gave a speech, wallahi, I don't even remember this incident. I don't even remember it. I don't remember that I went to his house, I gave a speech, but he remembers. He said, you came to my house, to my apartment, and you gave a speech, majlis, and I didn't have money, a gift to give you at that time. I was a student. Now I'm a physician. This is a thousand dollars. 
God does not leave any bill unpaid when you work for him. Put your goal. Focus on spiritual and moral services. Moral goals. Don't make money your main goal. Money will come. I'm not saying always work for free. No, don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. You must get a job. You must get a paying job. But if during certain circumstances an opportunity comes to serve and people do not have money to pay you, work for free. Say, I'm going to build God. Send the bill to God. And God will reimburse you. Yes, Mahdi. Where is Ali Muhammad? I need some oxygen. <laughs> some AC. Some AC, please. Yes, Mahdi. Thank you, Mehdi. Thank you so much. Number three, or number four. <clears throat> dedicate much of your time. Dedicate much of your time and effort to help other people and to reach out to them. And to be generous and kind to people. The hadith says, the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi When someone comes and says, I need your help. I need your assistance. I need you to come with me to the hospital, to the doctor's office, to the lawyer's office, to the... Don't repel that person. Don't tell him, no, 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 I'm busy. I'm busy with my wife, with my life, with my money, with my shop, with my school, with my finals. Don't. You have to welcome. This is a gift from God. This is a blessing that a person comes to you and asks for help. Do not repel. Don't repel any person. Try, try to reach out to them. If you can't afford to be with them, Try to find someone else. Say, I am not the right person for this, but I know another person. I know another friend who can stand with you, who can come with you. Do not abandon people. Do not turn your face away from people. When you help people, when you stand with people, when you reach out, when you try to make others happy, definitely you're going to be happy at the end of the day. You're going to go home with much satisfaction, with much sense of victory, with much sense of relief when you go home. That you did something positive today. God is going to reward you. God is the one who switches the hearts, believe me. Allah muqallib al qulub. Allah switches the hearts. So God can switch your heart from sadness into happiness, from helplessness and hopelessness into optimism and hope. So don't decline. Don't decline to help and don't reject. And find your happiness in making others happy. Find your happiness in making others happy. 
And this is why I want to ask you, all of you, to volunteer. We have to spread and promote the culture of volunteerism or volunteerism. We have to volunteer. Say, I give two hours, three hours, four hours, one hour, whatever you can afford, a week to my community, to my neighborhood, to my school, to my hospital, to my friends, to my mosque, to my church. Yes, sister. It's a good question. Yes. While you are trying to help others, at the same time, you need to teach them also to be independent. If you go with someone to doctor's office, to the hospital one time, the second time you tell him, see, I showed you the way. I led you today. I came with you to support you. Next time, you may go yourself. Try to teach them. Don't teach them to be completely dependent on you. Anything they want to, to do in, in their life, they pick up the phone, please come, fill this form for me, take me here, give me this. This is not good. I spoke about this point in the beginning. Try to be independent. So reach out to people, but at the same time, teach them the way. They say if someone is hungry, which is better, to give him the fish, or to teach him how to fish. Which one is better? Teach him to be self-sufficient. Because if you keep, and we were talking about this in the office, there are some beggars who come to you. And begging is, is, is terrible. It's not a good habit. Some of them, of course, they have needs, urgent needs. But some of them, it's not because of urgent need. It's a bad habit. They develop this bad habit. They learn. They learn to beg. And you can see them in every city, in every street. They are physically okay, mentally okay. They can work. They can earn good money with respect. But they decline. Why? Because they learn this bad habit, which is not good. We have to teach them that, no, listen, I can find you a job. Yes, today I can feed you. I can take care of you but I can find you a job if you want. And we see some of them outside the mosque here on Fridays. And Ali Muhammad, he goes and he speaks to them. And I tell them, listen, you cannot come here every Friday and beg. You are healthy, we can find you. We can find you work, decent work. So you can generate your own, your own income. The worst thing is to stretch your hand to people. This is the worst. God does not want to see you doing this unless the state of emergency, state of emergency. God wants you to be dignified, unless you are in, in a trouble. And then after that, maybe you ask for help, but don't try not to do that. Try not to ask for help, unless it's a state of emergency. So, and when you serve my friends, <clears throat> Serve with ikhlas and dedication. Do not serve reluctantly. Serving reluctantly when you don't like something, when people ask you to do something, you don't like it, and you are doing it reluctantly, is not going to earn you thawab and reward. It's not fulfilling. Teach yourself, when you do a job, you do it out of your heart, out of love. You put your love, you put your breath, you put your soul into this work. Teach yourself to learn ikhlas and learn dedication. And God says, I only accept the work of those who have ikhlas. God does not look at the amount of the work or the money you give. He looks at the quality, not the quantity. Quantity for him is irrelevant completely, whether you give a dollar or a million dollar. He looks at your spirit at the time of giving. This is why he says in his book, 
He says, when you give, give with a spirit of ikhlas. Even if you give little, God is going to accept it. God is going to accept this offering. Number five, never compare yourself to anyone in your life. You have family members, you have friends around you, your peers, people your age. Don't compare yourself to them. Don't do that. If you keep doing that, you're going to suffer. You are not going to be satisfied. You are not going to be happy in your life if you always compare yourself to this and that. But at the same time, you need a role model in your life. This role model, if you ask many speakers, many scholars, 99% are going to say, your model should be Ali ibn Abi Talib, the Prophet Ibrahim, Musa, and Isa. But I'm not going to say the same. Why? I'm not going to say the same because we have to be practical. We cannot reach Ali ibn Abi Talib. Ali ibn Abi Talib was a universal Imam. The Prophet was a universal messenger. We need examples, role models that are attainable, practical. We see them right before our eyes. Normal human being, just like us. Just like us. Many scholars when they advise people, they compare people to the imams. This is not right. Yes, we aspire to follow them, but we are not going to get there. You cannot find in the history of mankind a man who was the supreme leader of a huge country stretching from Morocco on the Atlantic to beyond China on the east. This was the Islamic country at his time, at the time of Imam Ali. But he lived in a small house that he built by his own hand for four years and eight months. And he did not have an office. They said to him, why you don't have an office? He said, my office is the street. Because if I sit my office and my, I lock down myself in an office, people cannot reach to me. I have to reach out to people. You cannot find such an example, no ruler, no president, no king, no sultan can do this today. No one can do this. And it's not practical. Today the president cannot walk in the market. You cannot see him in South Costa Plaza because he will trip and fall. You know. <laughs> no president can do that. So we have to bring examples of our you have to have a role model in your life a male a female a father an uncle a teacher a mentor a neighbor you have to look up to them and follow their example because they have a success story in their life because you see them they are virtuous they are happy they are accomplished so you have to have don't compare yourself with others but you must have a role model in your life to follow. <clears throat> uh, number six, resist temptations of living luxuriously. The life of extreme luxury, the life of greed, the life of materialism would result mostly in disasters. Many people, they aimed at making only money in their life. They made money, but they lost their families. They lost their wives. They lost their kids. They lost their friends. They lost their brothers. I know stories of siblings, siblings from one father and one mother. They have several cases in the court. They sued each other, siblings, siblings from same parents. They had a lot of money and they started because their only aim was money. It was not value or principles. They have several cases in the court, siblings. They don't talk to each other. Their kids do not speak to each other. 
is this worth it? You make money and you lose your friends, you lose your family, you lose your kids, you lose your husband, you lose your wife. Is it worth it? It's not worth it. Don't make excessive, excessive, luxurious life or material life your goal. Don't. You know, I, I do an average of three divorces per week. At least three divorces per week. I did a divorce this morning before I came to the Friday prayers. At least three, if not five, if not six a week. Most of these cases, when I look into them, the reason is they are fighting over what? Huh? Over money. They are fighting over money. They are disintegrating the family, demolishing the family, destroying the kids, mostly because of materialism. Stay away from materialism. I saw a person who was, <clears throat> he didn't have a job, he didn't have work, he didn't have income, but he was keen on buying a diamond ring for his fiance. He doesn't have money to eat to sustain himself, but because his fiance, she asked him for a diamond ring. And he was saving money. And he's not going to get it because diamond ring, how much is it in the market today? Sisters, you know better. Huh? I saw it once at Costco. <laughs> Believe me, it was $28,000 at Costco. This is not, this is insane. Happiness is not by a diamond ring or a fancy car or an expensive mansion. There are many people who have diamond rings and jewelry and expensive cars and huge mansions, but they are unhappy. They are fighting, they are unhappy. So don't make material goals your ultimate goals in this life. Number seven, humble yourself before your Lord and before mankind. An arrogant person with people, when you see him arrogant, dealing arrogantly with people, he is also arrogant with God when he deals with God. How do we become arrogant with God? When I go home and tell him, God, where are you? Give me. You didn't give me today. I'm unhappy. I'm not going to pray. I'm not going to worship you. This is arrogance. This is arrogance. When I fight with God. I'm not doing him a favor when I pray. I'm doing myself a favor. God is not waiting there. Sitting there and waiting for my fasting and my prayers and my dua. God said to Moses, Moses, if entire mankind, they don't pray, I'm not going to be hurt. And if in the entire mankind they pray and worship me, I'm not going to rejoice that. Nothing is going to change me. Neither they are going to hurt me nor benefit me. If they don't pray, they hurt themselves. They disconnect themselves from the source of, source of love and mercy and affection. They disconnect themselves. God is not going to be hurt. So humble yourself before God. And you need, in your life, private moments to be alone by yourself. Don't let your parents watch you or know about your location or hear your voice or see your Im image. Be by yourself, whether it is your bedroom, whether it's the beach, whether it's, uh, it's the forest, whether it's the wood, whether it's the mountain. Be by yourself and talk to God with the humility. And converse with God. God loves to hear your voice. The prophet says sometimes we pray and God does not answer. Not because he doesn't want to answer. God says, 
because I need to hear this voice more. If I fulfill the need for him, he's not going to pray anymore. I'm going to lose his voice. So I keep, I delay, I delay his need. I don't fulfill it for him. I don't give it to him. So he keeps praying and I keep listening and enjoying his voice. God wants to hear your voice and your intimate voice, not your diplomatic voice. God does not like diplomatic tone, diplomatic speech, artificial speech, artificial intelligence. God wants you to be yourself, to be natural. He loves your voice. He loves to hear your serious, your intimate, your original voice without a microphone. He doesn't need a microphone. Moses asked God, God, أَأَنْتَ قَرِيبٌ فَأُنَاجِيكَ أَمْ بَعِيدٌ فَأُنَادِيكَ Should I scream when I talk to you or should I whisper? God said to him, Moses, if once you remember me, you will find me sitting next to you. You don't have to raise your voice. Sitting next to you. Once you remember me, once I come to your mind, I'll be next to you, sitting next to you. We are closer to man than his jugular vein. And therefore, don't miss your prayers, my friends. One of the reasons for inner satisfaction, and I'm telling you out of experience. A day I miss my Fajr prayers, I feel guilty the entire day. The entire day. I feel damaged. I feel broken. I feel helpless. I regret every second. Don't miss your prayers. Your salat is your source of energy. Your source of hope. Your source of peace. Don't miss it. Allocate certain hours. Certain minutes, I should say. Minutes. Minutes. Seconds. Just to connect with God but to connect in intimately. In the mosque, we cannot con connect intimately when we pray together, when we are in public, when people are watching us. So you have to have your own private moments. Number nine. <clears throat> Be humble with people. Don't be arrogant with people. Don't look at yourself superior. When you sit with people, do not make them feel that they are lower than you and you are there. Don't do that. Even if you are the most knowledgeable, the richest person, the most intelligent, the most attractive and beautiful and handsome, when you speak to people, humble yourself. Humble yourself. The more humble, humbleness, humility is the essence of religion. If you ask me, if you ask me, Sayyid, what is the essence of Islam and faith? Can you put it in one word? Yes, I can put it. After 60 years, I can put this in only one word, humility. Humble yourself. This is the product of religion. The Prophet came to his mosque one day and said to the companions, I don't see the product of faith on your behavior. They said, what is it? What do you mean? He said, the, pro the, the prophet said, I don't see you being humble. You pray, you fast, you read the Quran, but you are not humble. The product of faith is humility. It's when you humble yourself. When you humble yourself, I promise you, I promise you, I, Mustafa al qazwini promise you sincerely and solemnly promise you that you're going to earn inner satisfaction and happiness, internal happiness, internal happiness. <clears throat> Number nine, maybe some of you are not going to like this, but it's a reality. Be moderate in using social media. Social media is a two-edged sword. 
Some people can build themselves through social media and others destroy themselves. You have to be very wise, very intelligent. Wake up when you use social media. Social media is an addiction. Social media today, today is a major source of anxiety and depression, especially among the young generation. Read the surveys. Read the surveys. Check them out. Be moderate. I'm not saying put it aside because I use social media, but I use it moderately. I'm not addicted to it. I control it. I don't let so social media to control me. I choose the time to use it. I don't wake up in the early morning and use social media or late. If I have some free time, extra time, I will use it. I don't let social media to control my life. Many of you are suffering, and I, let me be very open with you and very humble with you. You are suffering, you have anxiety, you have depression, you have fear, and you feel sometimes hopeless because of social media. Why? Because social media allows you to check people's life out, to check it out. The food, the drink, the coffee, the cake, the restaurant, the cafe, the dress, the shoes, you name it. Left and right, and this is not good. God said to Prophet Muhammad, Prophet Muhammad, you want to be happy, always happy, always strong, always optimistic? Don't stretch your eyes to what people do and what people have. وَلَا تَمُدَّنْ This is Surah Taha in this book. وَلَا تَمُدَّنْ عَيْنَيْكَ إِلَى مَا مَتَّعْنَا بِهِ أَزْوَاجًا مِنْهُمْ زَهْرَةَ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا لِنَفْتِنَهُمْ فِيهِ وَرِزْقُ رَبِّكَ خَيْرٌ وَأَبْقَى Don't keep checking people's life. What they ate, where did they go, what house they bought, what car, what, what, whatever. Don't do that. Don't do that. It will make you sad because you start comparing yourself to others. Why did they do this? Why did they accomplish and I didn't accomplish? This is the questions that comes to your mind. And this is not good. This is not healthy. Control. Control the screen time. Control it. Control it. And last but not least, my friends, <clears throat> respond to the needs of three things. Each and every one of you carries three precious things. You have to maintain them, you have to protect them. Brain, soul, and body. Brain, soul, and body. All of them are important. All of them make you strong. If one of you is a broken, you get a broken completely. If your brain is broken, if your soul, if your body, you don't enjoy life. So maintain them and take care of them. When it comes to your brain, choose carefully what you watch. Choose carefully what you read. Choose, select, select the good products. When it comes <clears throat> to your body, choose the healthy food. Avoid junk food. I was walking in Europe, on the streets of many cities in Europe. And I found something very interesting. We don't have it in America. I don't know whether I should say this or not. I don't want to offend anyone. Let me rephrase it. There is no junk food there. Little junk food. People are healthier. There is public transportation. People walk. They have to walk. They don't ride cars from door to door. They look healthy. In America, we don't look healthy because we are spoiled. And one of the reasons we eat junk food. 
God says in his book, فَلْيَنْظُرِ الْإِنسَانُ إِلَى طَعَامِهِ When you eat, examine the food that you are eating. Examine it. Don't put anything in your stomach just because you are hungry. Don't do that. Be careful with the food that you eat. And enjoy a good night's sleep. My advice to you is that not to stay up late unless it's an emergency. Emergency. Otherwise, go to bed by 10 p.m. Now it is pa past bedtime, 10, 10, 10. But this is an exception tonight. Maybe once a week, twice a week, it's okay. But enjoy a good night's sleep and then allocate a portion of your time to mental exercise and also 